Good morning. It is 1016, Wednesday, June 3rd. This is the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the associate editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. And this might be the last week of the lockdown locks. New York City is opening up next Monday. I am Bill Finley. I'm a correspondent with the Thoroughbred Daily News. Isn't it amazing to think that this Saturday would have been the running of the Belmont Stakes under normal times, ending up the Triple Crown? We haven't even started the Triple Crown yet. John Green, general manager of DJ Stable, and I am just so thankful that all these racetracks are opening and that we have more racing um, other than poor recently completed Fawner. Um, Thank you, Naira. Thank you to uh, all the other racing jurisdictions that worked hard to get racing up and running. And uh, we are just all really blessed that everyone's healthy and that racing is uh, in full force and on the back cover of today's New York Post. Which was good for them. Good to see that. I'm Alan Carrasso, Managing Editor of the TDN, and uh, great to be on with you guys. Looking forward to a good show. Uh, So we'll start with John's very heartfelt appreciation of Belmont Park. Uh, I feel it. I feel it even more, you know, as a a born and raised New Yorker. It's it's been a really scary time for the last couple of months. and still is a scary time for some different reasons now. But in terms of the racing world, I think the return of Belmont completes the, the return to normalcy. Uh, I know there are still a couple of tracks here and there that aren't running parks comes to mind, but you know, Belmont is to me, the crown jewel of racing outside of Saratoga. And it's just, it has, it has its own feel, it has its own different feel from the rest of the New York tracks, from the the rest of, the, of America's tracks. And it just, it doesn't feel like spring in New York for me without Belmont running. So like John said, we're, we're super grateful for all the work behind the scenes that really that got us to this point today is opening day uh looks like it might rain which is unfortunate because there's a really nice turf race there's the bogey it's only six horses but it's a lot of nice horses in there and it's just gonna be an action-packed meet because they had to truncate it down to 25 days still running most of the stakes they would have run normally uh this saturday we've got the carrier we've got the the westchester we're going to talk to shug mcgee a little later where code of honor is going to make his seasonal debut in the Westchester, but, you know, I want to go, I want to, you know, I get, we get criticized a little bit sometimes for being too uh, America centric. So I want to, I want to include the the French classics that were run this week at Dovey with the, uh, the thousand guineas and the, and the 2000 guineas. Um, some pretty nice races. It was, it was cool. Actually. I thought to hear like the jockeys whooping it up with no fans. I think that's really interesting. And that's something that could be cool and could be a, a, a bright side of, Sports returning without fans is you get to hear more of the player interaction, you get more hear more of the exultation from the athletes. I think that's pretty cool. So uh, I wanted to give a pop to, to France for getting back racing and really starting the, the Euro resurgence of racing um, this summer. And uh, just wanted to open it up to you guys. We're going to talk specifically about some races that are coming up this week, but about Belmont opening up and getting back to normal and racing and how privileged we are to do it. Yeah, I mean, Joe, well said. It's great to see Belmont back. And I look at it also as the bigger picture. And we've got all the major racetracks, the big ones in uh, California, of course, Santa Anita, Churchill Downs in Kentucky and Belmont in New York and Gulfstream as well this time of year. There is uh, really now with Belmont coming back, you have all the major racetracks back. Best of my knowledge, the only place in, in the country that is not yet given the green light for racing to resume is Pennsylvania. A lot of problems going on there, but it looks like they're going to come along uh, within a week or two as well. So, you know, there's so much more of a sense of normalcy now. The one thing, though, it's, you know, we, we're kind of taking for granted the whole idea of let's get back to racing without fans because that's what everybody wanted and everybody knew that that's the best we could do. So now that we've gotten through this step, let's hope now that we can go to what would be a giant step forward to get fans back into the stands. Looks like it's not going to happen for either Saratoga or Del Mar, the two meets in the country that rely more on on on-track attendance than really anything else, which is a shame. So hopefully in the fall, maybe at Santa Anita, the fall of Belmont, we can get fans back into the stands and we can have racing 100% back to normal. Yeah, it's just so wonderful that we have all these racing jurisdictions that are that are racing. Um, and I think, Joe, you may have mentioned it in, in last week's podcast, but it's so nice. It's such a breath of fresh air that all these racing jurisdictions um, and factions amongst our industry are working together. Um, and whether it's the, you know, the, the tracks that host the Triple Crown races that, that kind of work together to try to fashion together a, uh, you know, a Triple Crown racing circuit, 
or even more surprising, the various sales companies um, that are working together, whether it's OBS, Phasic Tipton, and, and of course, our sponsor, Keeneland, um, that are working together to work out dates and work out logistics. It's just so nice because I remember the first couple of shows that we did together almost a year ago, and it was so frustrating to have all of these splinter groups um, that were really just looking after their own fiefdoms and their, their own territory. And people have woken up and said, we need to, and it took a pandemic to do it basically, but they've woken up and said, we need to work together. And even though we may be Hatfields and the McCoys for, for you know 90% of the year, for this time and in this stress test, we have to get our, our acts together and work together to make the industry better. And that, in a nutshell, has been a great silver lining of all of, of this, you know, just the, the pandemic and, and all the worry and, and illness and, and nervousness, um, is that the industry is actually starting to galvanize a little bit. Um, and we can take pot shots at, yeah, well, they're not doing this right. And there's still trainers that are, that are cheating the system. And there's still, you know, this and that and, and all the other issues that are still there. But at least we're all kind of going in that positive direction. Um, because, you know, no offense, but when was the last time we heard PETA have an issue with us? Or when was the last time that we had the FBI come in? And it's sad that we have to use those as our benchmarks that, hey, we haven't had a protest in a while. So that's a good thing. But it really, I, I, I'm, I'm re-energized about the way that the industry is getting together and trying to salvage and move forward and even make better um, the products that we have. So, you know, again, a tip, I, I know I hear, I'm here and I go on a soapbox every now and then and, and say, why didn't they do this? Or how come this isn't working? It looks like we're going in the right direction, and I'm really proud to be part of the industry um, in in this day and age. You'd need a pretty big soapbox to get to the Monomoy Girl level, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Alan. Uh, we'll, that one's in know, storage. We'll, yes, and keep that one in storage. We'll allow you the soapbox <laughs> All right, once once a month. There you go. Um, I'm obviously thrilled to see Belmont back and um, you know, do hope the rains stay away to see a rushing Paul got stormy matchup in the, um, in the bogey. Um, I guess I'm just happy to have it back. And um, I don't get to go out to racetracks very often anymore for a variety of reasons, but um, eh, this is kind of simplistic, but they just ran the Japanese Derby this weekend. Sorry. I knew it was going to have to get squeezed in somehow. Um, but usually there are 190,000 people that pack into Tokyo race course for, for that race. The, the noise is deafening as the horses are loading in the gate. They ran that race this weekend in front of zero fans. Um, and they've kept racing in, in Japan, another issue altogether. So, I mean, we, we can do it. It's, um, you know, like everything associated with the pandemic, in, in my mind, everything is a short term inconvenience. We, we do this now for the sustenance of the game. Um, we sort of bite the bullet and do what we have to do. And, and the doors will open, you know, if not this year, then, then next year and, and everybody will be okay. So um, just great to have it, have it back. And like you said, Joe, the French classics were run uh, earlier this week. We've got the English classics coming up this weekend uh, or the guineas this weekend. So things are getting back into full swing. And we're, we're going to touch on that a little bit, uh, just, just to the point about not having fans. I'm going to put on my uh, epidemiologist hat real quick. I'm sure I'll get angry emails from actual doctors. But it seems to me like the, the main issue in terms of transmission is indoors. There's, like, there's not as many outdoor transmission cases. So I think there is maybe a possibility in terms of like baseball games or something like that, some kind of outdoor event where you can let in 25% capacity and, and enforce things and have like sanitizing stations and all that stuff. I think that that's at least a potential possibility down the road. But yeah, like I agree with Al that it's just, if not, it's just something we're going to have to suck up and, and and deal with for the rest of this year. I mean, in the fall, people were talking about a resurgence, a second wave. So I, I, I wouldn't bank on, on having fans then either. But, you know, the main thing is that we have the product. We, we have the product when a lot of other sports do not have the basic product for people to watch and wager on and enjoy and be entertained by. So I think that that part is, is just, it's, it's a lifeblood. It's, it's, I mean, it's a lifeline rather to all of us in the sport, whether you're a better owner, trainer, whatever, it's a lifeline to, to really just, you know, get some sense of normalcy, get some money in your pocket and just, just get kind of a return to 
life pre coronavirus because I think that's what everybody wants. And it's been a, it's it's been a tough couple of months. It's seemed like endless. It seems like it's been years since we. I just I can't I can't I can't forget that podcast that we had where we were talking about the indictments and everything. And we were also jazzed up and amped up. And then we come out of the room. And then like an hour later, the NBA cancels its season. And just everything went to, to, to the trash heap after that. And it just, I don't know, it, it's its funny. I mean, it's not funny, but it's scary how the world can change, like in a blink of an eye. And we, we talked about that at the time. But I also want to salute to all you guys for, for sticking it out with me on the podcast, everybody who works on the podcast, because it's been it's been a little challenging some weeks to, to you know, scrounge up topics and, and, and find stuff to talk about. You know, we can always make fun of John and John being rich, but, you know, you, can, you can't do that for a straight hour. You know, you really have to have to have some substance. So shout out to you guys for sticking it out. I think it's only going to get easier from here. Um, I wanted to transition from that into what's going on this weekend, because this is a, a monster weekend of racing on both sides of the pond. Uh, just to just to touch on a few, we talked about Belmont. You got the the Carter and, and the Westchester Carters of Breeders' Cup winning your end race for the sprint. You got the Santa Anita Derby, the Santa Anita Oaks. You can see Authentic and Honor AP clash in the Santa Anita Derby in the Oaks. We should have a rematch of Gamin and Speech, which would they threw down in that Oaklawn allowance. And, and you know, back at home at Santa Anita, they should be only only even better than that. And like Al mentioned, the the English Classics over the weekend horse that really broke through to me and who I think was the best, I'm not going out on a limb here, but I think was the best two-year-old in the world last year was Pinatubo. And he went six for six as a two-year-old, was absolutely devastating in his victories, won the Cartier Champion Two-Year-Old Award, um, hasn't run yet at three, obviously. And I think, you know, with the topsy-turvy nature of the three-year-old division, and we have those, those, those big four I think he could still be the best three-year-old in the world too. So he's going to run in the English 2000 guineas. Very, very excited to see him, see if he's the same horse or, you know, possibly even better. And Al's probably got some stuff to say about that, but a couple other group ones, the coronation at, uh, is the coronation Al? No, that's, that's at Ascot, right? Coronation is at Ascot. Yeah. There's another group one race though, besides the 2000, 1000 guineas. That's escaping me. Yeah, I've got to look at like everything so jumbled in all, uh, out of order. I've kind of lost track of it, really. But anyway, so we, we're gonna have we're gonna have tons of top level talent on the racetrack this weekend, all across the world. And you know that kind of seemed pretty impossible a month or two ago that we, we would be able to see that. And it's here it is. It's the first weekend in June, and, and we're back to uh, seeing a, a, a star studded racing landscape and it's it's super exciting just wanted to get some quick thoughts from you guys on what you're looking forward to this weekend well joe first of all i firmly disagree with you i'd be glad to do a one-hour podcast just making fun of john the whole time we a matter of fact i think we ought to give it a try yeah uh, a lot of sponsors there's a lot of sponsorship you uh, you know, interest in that in that kind of show <laughs> well i mean obviously the big picture this weekend revolves around the san Anita derby you know lots of great races but we're still in three-year-old mode again it seems odd to be in three-year-old mode when uh on the weekend when the belmont stakes would be ending the triple crown as i mentioned earlier a couple things about the san Anita derby i want to see what honor ap can do because this is a horse that people have really been on his bandwagon for a long time and i think it's time for him to kind of put up or shut up now, if he runs a good second to authentic, is, is that good enough? Uh, maybe not so, because I think a lot of people have been riding this horse's bandwagon, as I said before, and really think that he's a, a horse that can make some major noise in the Triple Crown. So I want to see what he can do. Obviously, authentic. Uh, we know what he can do already. And I'm probably the only guy out there that's even going to bring this up. But I wish these horses would come back in the Belmont Stakes. I mean, what's it's two weeks. It's not two seconds, two days. We're going to talk to Shug McGahee in a little while. Easy Goer ran five times in a nine-week period between the Gotham and the Belmont Stakes. Uh, ran in the Gotham Wood Memorial, the three Triple Crown races. That wasn't 100 years ago. Horses can still do it. I know it's never going to happen, but it, it's kind of unfortunate that the San Anita Derby is tripping over the Belmont a little bit. But we understand why when everybody had to scramble late in the game to put all their dates together and get these races to go. Yeah, I think that would be a, a yeoman's ask to to run in the San Anita Derby and then go cross country within two weeks and, and run in the Belmont. But you're right, Bill, it'd be awesome to see it. Um, and and today's modern day athlete is not the same as it was even 
30 years ago or 25 years ago when Easygoer was was running and and had those kind of campaigns. I mean, we're not talking about Manowar who actually ran in races between the Triple Crown races. Um, you know, but today's modern day athlete, that's really not, you know, that, that's kind of not what they do. I mean, and I know as an owner, it's tough to get these horses to peak and then let down and then peak again, especially when you have a, you know, a large or a long, um, you know, transfer, like from one coast to the other. But man, it would be awesome to see these horses campaign and run against each other in Santa Anita and then all fly um, over to Belmont and to run in the Belmont. And I'm, I'm not just saying that because a couple of my horses in my stable, um, you know, for the contest are California based. Um, but I would, you know, I'd love to see some of these horses run more often um, because really a lot of the horses that are going to be running in the Santa Anita Derby and some of the preps have only run literally a handful of times. And now you're talking June of their three-year-old year. So these horses really should be, you know, have, they should have six, seven, eight races under their belt um, by this time, you know, during a normal, you know, campaign. Um, but obviously that's not going to happen now. We'll just have to wait and see how Santa Anita, you know, Derby plays out and then uh, ultimately see how they start to strategize and pick up points for the, uh, for the Kentucky Derby. Um, that being said, I, I think you guys talked a lot about already, you took a lot of my talking points about um, some of the big races going on this, this week. What's really, again, what's really nice is that we have all these big races across the world to talk about. Um, and it really seems like that now it's picking up steam and we're going to be able to talk about these horses instead of these issues. And speaking of Code of Honor, I'm, just, I'm, cur- I'm curious to see how Shug manages him. We'll ask, um, we'll ask him in, in, in a bit um, just to see, pick his brain to see exactly what kind of horse he thinks he is. Um, he, he could follow in, in the steps of an honor code and, and become a, a sharp miler, but he obviously stays 10 furlongs. So be interesting to see exactly what Code of Honor, how he's campaigned this, this year. But, uh, hey, it's nice to have a big weekend to look forward to. Hell yeah. And there'll be a lot to talk about after, after this week as well. Um, I, think, I think it's, we, we were on the runway last week and now we're taking off in terms of racing for the summer. And I, I think it's, it's really exciting. All systems go now. Uh, so, so we'll, we'll break it all down for you next week. Um, can't believe I talked more Euro than Al did. That's, that's the biggest upset of the podcast. Uh, so maybe, maybe I'll be the, the TDN writer's room Euro expert when you're not here, Al. You can, you can I'll be your print, your apprentice for that position. You're capable, more than capable. <laughs> TDN Writers Room is presented by Keeneland. Keeneland will conduct an online select Horses of Racing Age sale on June 23rd in the Keeneland Digital Sales Ring. Entries are accepted through June 12th. Learn more at keenelanddigital.com. We also have the summer meet coming up at Keeneland. The Kentucky Horse Racing Commission Race Dates Committee unanimously approved Keeneland's request to conduct a spectator-free five-day summer meet July 8th through 12th. Going to be action-packed, going to be a total blast. I can't wait for it. Um, it's going to be nine to 10 races daily and 10 graded stakes races in those five days traditionally run during the spring meet. And it's going to include the, the bluegrass and the Ashland, usually the, the, the centerpieces for three-year-olds during the meet and during the April spring meet at, at Keeneland. So super looking forward to that. Like I said, it's just going to be an action packed calendar overall, but we're glad that Keeneland was able to squeeze these five days in. And it's, I don't know, it's just, it's going to be the perfect lead into Saratoga for me. It's just, it's going to be nonstop action for probably two months starting with Keeneland. John, I know you're interested in the Horses of Racing Age sale part of it. Uh, what, do you, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, every year we go through the process uh, within our organization of um, taking some of the horses that still have conditions and that still have some upside potential and entertain the idea of putting them into these Horses of Racing Age sale. And we've done well over the past couple of years. Um, and sometimes it just takes you know a, a different uh, stable and a different venue for some of these horses to blossom and 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 do well in, in another program, um, this year we're actually going to enter between seven and ten horses into the Keeneland Horses of Racing Age Sale um, with our friends at Hiddenbrook, and uh, we're actually moving all of those racehorses over to Hiddenbrook South, so they're centrally located. Because our understanding is that the Keeneland Sale is going to be virtual, 100% virtual, so the horses aren't going to be on the grounds um, or anything. So we want to try to make it easier for people to come and, and look at the horses. Um, the other thing that's interesting about this upcoming sale that really, you know, caused us to to enter the horses into the Keeneland sale is that they're not charging any commissions for any horses that are bought back. 
So if we put a reserve on a horse um, and it doesn't meet that value, Keeneland's not charging uh, anybody who does that. So it's really kind of a, a great opportunity to, to maximize some, some dollars on some horses, um, move some horses to other programs, and really have minimal expenses to do so. Um, so I appreciate Keeneland doing it. And uh, like I said, we're going to enter um, you know, a number of horses into the sale and, and the sales like in, in three weeks. So uh, I'm curious to see how it all works out virtually, but that's ultimately where a lot of these sales are going to have to go um, is, you know, at least have some sort of virtual platform for bidding purposes. Yeah. And, you know, Keeneland has been on the forefront of that. They were one of the first ones to announce uh, that they were going to move to digital bidding, online bidding. Um, so yeah, that's coming up in a couple of weeks. Pack sales calendar, pack racing calendar. Keeneland will be at the forefront of that for sure. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. Owning a multiple grade stakes winning racehorse like Hard Not to Love is attainable with a partnership like West Point Thoroughbreds. Partnerships enable you to spread your ownership across several horses for less than it costs to own one horse alone. John, you listening? This increases your racetrack action and chances for a big horse. Check out why West Point Thoroughbreds is the gold standard in racing partnerships at westpointtb.com. Some action last week for West Point Thoroughbreds, like at last, like at last for all of us. They had a bunch of horses running at a Churchill. Uh, they had Hard Not to Love, who ran in the Santa Maria, and I thought ran a pretty good race, ran second, beat CC, got the revenge on her from the Beholder Mile, but just couldn't reel in the, the Bob Baffert upsetter who went wire to wire. Um, so shout out to them for that. Another nice little uh, black tie placing for her as she racks up the earnings. Uh, they also had a nice turf maiden winner that I wanted to mention on Sunday in the finale at, uh, at Churchill named Cavalry Charge, the Honor Code Colt, who had picked up some checks on the dirt um, run some pretty sneaky good figures, I would say, on the thoroughgraph scale and uh, switched to the turf and did something that is not that easy. St stretched out from six furlongs on the dirt to nine furlongs on the turf and won by open lengths. Like, that's not an easy thing to do. So he's an interesting horse going forward. Might have a new future on the lawn. Um, so glad to see West Point back in action. Glad to see those silks again. And I think it's only going to get better for them from here. Uh, obviously, hard not to love. Is, should have a big summer as well. So Shout out to the sponsor, and we're glad to see you guys doing well. So some sad news to report this week. This broke yesterday morning. There were rumors flying all around Twitter, and it was soon confirmed by the by the people at Judmont that uh, Arrogate had to be euthanized. Um, at this point, an undetermined illness. Uh, they said that he had a what, what they thought was a, was a sore neck, and at some point he collapsed in his stall and wasn't able to get back up. Seems like they did everything they could at Haggier to try to diagnose the problem and fix the problem. And then just after four days, he still just wasn't getting up. Obviously a, a terrible thing. It's, it's terrible when, when any horse dies, but especially one as young and as full of promise and potential as a stallion as him. He was only seven years old. Um, I told this story on, on Twitter yesterday that after I started at TDN, he was the first rising star that I made the call on. I saw him break his maiden at Santa Anita and I was super impressed. He also had a race before that where he ran third. That was really impressive. So I felt pretty strongly about him. Obviously did not have any inclination or indication that he was going to go on to do everything he did, you know, shatter the track record in the Travers, running 159 and change. Dubai World Cup victory. I mean, that was honestly may have been the best racing performance I have ever seen. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I put Go Sapper up there, but you know, other than him, it's that's it's hard to beat that to break last the way he did in a 14 horse field loop everybody and win in hand over a horse like a gun runner who was second in there who obviously went on to do tremendous things the rest of the year when the breeders cup classic was the horse of the year when the pegasus after that it's an out and out monster and arrogate dusted him like he was standing still despite breaking last and having to loop the entire field absolutely jaw-dropping performance and he was, he's right up there. He's right up there in the two or three best horses I've ever seen in my racing life. Um, I think he was going to be a, a tremendous stallion. And also he was one of the last remaining sons of Unbridled Song at Stud. 
And I think that that was, was really important too, because he's just, Unbridled Song was a brilliant racehorse and has been a brilliant sire and has sired fast horses all over the place. Uh, he, he died recently in the last couple of years and he just, he's left a legacy. And I'm hoping that even with his short time at stud, Arrogate will leave a legacy too, because he does have, he does have three crops. His first crop will sell his yearlings this year. If you can buy one, you should buy one because especially if they're a cult, because you never know you, it might be on you to keep the arrogate tree going. Um, tragic news. I'll leave it up to you guys. Uh, I, 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 first of all, just want to give my, my condolences to everybody at Judmont, everybody that cared for arrogate as sad as we all are, it's going to be exponentially worse for people that actually have their hands on the horse and, uh, he will be missed. Jill, and the risk of being redundant, I want to also talk about the Dubai World Cup because you're absolutely right. That was one of the best performances any of us will see in our lifetimes for all the reasons you just said with him getting squeezed at the start, dropping back to last, running down gun runner, et cetera. So I just want to add to that what you said, what Bob Baffert told me when I called him yesterday. And he too wanted to talk about that race. And the quote I'm paraphrasing was that if Secretariat were alive and well and in that Dubai World Cup, He's not sure he could have beaten Arrogate that day. Now, these are all hypotheticals and that sort of thing. But that tells you the kind of level of respect Baffert has for the horse and also for that particular performance. He's a little bit overshadowed because he comes in between the two Triple Crown winners in American Pharaoh and Justify. And you're never going to get a trainer to compare horses like that. But talking to Baffert, I really think he thinks that Arrogate was every bit as good as the two Triple Crown winners. He just had sort of a different kind of career, not running in the Triple Crown races and then making his name, starting with the Travers, that just tremendous four race run from the Travers to the Breeders' Cup Classic to the Pegasus to the Dubai World Cup. Those are a good a four race streak as any horse has had. In our lifetimes and probably we'll see in our rest of our lifetimes. Yeah. And, and, and Bill, since you touched on um, the Pegasus world cup, which was just, you know, an outstanding uh, event. Um, I'm going to flip back to the Travers that, that he won um, that Joe alluded to before, you know, it was a track record, which was phenomenal. Uh, he went wire to wire, beat a very good field of 13 horses in the race and he was 11 to one. So if that goes to show you, just the talent in that race where he was 11 to one um, and just blew them away, especially the last quarter of a mile. It was, it was a seminal moment in my racing history of watching a horse like that. Um, and we do have a breeding side of our organization and we wanted to breed to him the first two years that he was standing at stud and couldn't get um, a season to him. Ironically enough, we were supposed to breed a, a filly of ours um, to him this week. And early on in the week, um, we started hearing rumors that there may be an issue with him of, of he wasn't going to be breeding. And then subsequently, we didn't realize it was this bad where it, it ended up being his demise. Um, but we were that close to, to breeding one of our mares to what I think is one of the top five racehorses that I've ever seen. Um, and between the Travers and the Pegasus World Cup and the Dubai World Cup. And oh, by the way, don't forget, he also won the Breeders' Cup Classic as a three year old. Um, you know, he was just a phenomenal racehorse. Um, and phenomenal looking and, and earned 17 and a half million dollars, which I don't know if that number is going to be, you know, eclipsed ever in, in our lifetime. Um, but just all around had the breeding, had the looks, Joe, you mentioned unbridled song, which, uh, you know, it, it, he is quickly coming into his own as far as being a sire of sire and a broodmare sire, um, that, that you want. And you mentioned before about try to buy a yearling, I think his weanling average was almost quarter of a million dollars, um, you know, for a weanling. So um, good luck with with being able to afford to, to try to buy a, a yearling, um, especially a good looking one of, of that, uh, you know, of, of, of Arrogate's, uh, you know, gene pool. Um, but just an astonishing horse and equally as astonishing that he's gone just like that. So um, I highly recommend that if you haven't watched any of his, any of those races we mentioned, um, just watch it on YouTube or watch it on online. And even knowing that he's going to win, you'd still be surprised at the way that he does it. It was Secretariat-esque in a couple of those races. I think, too, um, it, a tip of the hat to the Judmont Brass. And Judmont has known the world over for campaigning turf horses like Frankel and Enable. And they came up with a plan. They hatched a plan to buy American classic bred dirt horses. And they, they tasked Bob Baffert and Denon Alani with, with finding them the right horse to win those types of races in America. And, um, 
you know, the success is just overwhelming. Um, as great as the World Cup was, and I, I agree with all of you, um, it was jaw dropping and miraculous. To run down California Chrome as a three year old, spotting him loads of experience and to chase him around there, to, to grab him at the eighth hole and say, okay, this is my race. I mean, that showed just what sort of tenacity he had. And, um, and so he'll go down as, as one of the greats. And in terms of the book of mares that he bred, he bred Songbird, um, Judmont bought uh, Paul's silver mining privately to, to read to him. They did that um, with several grade one winners. So the quality of stock in his book of mares, they'll have three crops. Um, it'll be something to watch in a few years when, when they get the track. His first yearlings uh, would be sold this year. So um, let's see what happens. But um, yeah, condolences to, to John Munt, to Garrett O'Rourke, and uh, Donald Erskine, Prince College, and um, tremendous loss. Just a couple of things I wanted to, to add on there. It still hurts my heart that I didn't crush him at 11 to 1 in the Travers after I made that whole spiel about him being my first rising star. I remember what happened. He drew the rail and he had, he had a, a little tendency in his first couple of races to break a half step slowly. And I, I was a little bit worried that he would get squeezed like that. It reminded me so much of my other favorite horse, Ghost Sapper, in the Breeders' Cup Classic because he had never gone to the lead before. And he drew the rail and they were like, screw it. We're just going to put the best horse on the lead. So I remember joking to Brian after he drew the rail on the Travers. I was like, well, I guess he's just going to have to do a Ghost Sapper now. And he did even more than that, you know, and he just... 159.36 was the time 13 and a half lengths was the margin of victory 122 buyer which is just freakish and unheard of these days in racing ran a 120 al mentioned him running down california chrome pretty a loose california chrome in the stretch of the breeders cup classic got a 120 there credible performance got a 119 in the pegasus world cup and i think i you know some someone can check me on this but i wonder if there's a horse who beat back-to-back -back horses of the year and it wasn't consecutive races because he had the pegasus in in the middle but in two out of three races he beat horses of the year in california chrome in 2016 and then gun runner two starts later in the dubai world cup and never won a horse of the year trophy on his own because he only he had those two big races as a three-year-old and as a four-year-old i think you know some the boom came off the rose a little bit for some people when he came back from dubai it didn't win after that he was off the board in the san diego at one to twenty he was good, I thought, in the Pacific Classic, was just beaten a half length by Collective. He was really talented, stable made of his. And then he just didn't fire at all in the Breeders' Cup. And I always, I, people said he wasn't the same horse. I just wonder, all three of those races were at Del Mar. And I just would have loved to see him be able to run somewhere else, at least once after Dubai, to see if he was still that same horse. Because I just, I, I get this sneaking suspicion that he wasn't a huge fan of the Del Mar track because he had an allowance win the previous year at Del Mar that really wasn't, did not foretell that what he was going to do in the Travers. It was a very workmanlike victory. So I would have liked to see him run somewhere else. That's a digression. It's interesting that he beat two horses of the year in three starts and never won that trophy himself, but phenomenal, phenomenal race horse, once in a generation talent. And, uh, you know, we really hope to see his, his progeny on the track succeed and then create successful progeny of their own so he can have like a little little sire tree in his, his only, only his three years at stud. So we'll miss you, big guy. Condolences to everybody that ever laid hands on him. He did a great job. And uh, we look forward to seeing his babies on the track. Joining the West Point Thoroughbreds Partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtv.com. We'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds.
So this week we're going to do something different and it's going to go on through the uh, rest of the three-year-old season, including the triple crown races. Shout out to Brian DiDonato for this idea. So we're going to do basically a three-year-old fantasy draft and it's going to be all five of us who are on the show regularly. And we're going to pick four horses each. So it's 20 horses total. And we're going to tally up the points that those horses earn in the prep races and the triple crown races the rest of the way. The winner gets bragging rights and maybe we'll do a charitable donation at the end. We're still uh, kind of sorting that out. So we're going to do right now, we're going to do the draft. We're going to do a snake draft. Uh, so we're going to have re- reverse the order after each round. Um, each panelist, like I said, drafts a four horse stable and each panelist is required to draft at least one horse who currently has zero Kentucky Derby points. So we're going to try to go outside the box with at least one of our picks and they're going to earn points, and then we'll see who's uh, who's on top at the end, who's got the bragging rights, similar to the Triple Crown uh, throwdown that we have in the TDN with Brian and Steve Chirac and, and Ed DeRosa. But this is cooler because you can actually see our faces. So let's start it right now. I got the number one pick. The order is me, then John. We had a trade. We actually had a, a, a pre-draft trade between John and Brian. John and Brian had gotten the second pick, and he and John traded. So right now the order is me, then John, then Bill then Al, and then Brian, and then we're going to reverse that order for the second round and then reverse back and so forth. All right, so, so once again, all of, the, all of the points that these horses earn throughout the prep season are going to go to our individual stables. We're going to start it off this week with the Santa Anita Derby, which is 100 points to first place, 40 to second place, 20 to third, and 10 to fourth place. Then after that, two weeks later is the Belmont. You can see the rest of the schedule. The only one that's still uh, to be determined is the Travers because we don't have a date for that. We don't know uh, the points distributions either, but it culminates with the Derby September 5th, which is 300 points. So we're going to make that double the top uh, points distribution of the other races. So 300 for first, 120 for second, 60 for third and 30 for fourth. And then the last race will be the Preakness October 3rd, which is going to be 150, 60, 30 and 15. So that's the way it's going to shake out. There's going to be some lower points races, some really big points races, and you're going to be really rewarded if your horse runs well in the triple crown races. So looking forward to getting it, getting it started on Saturday. So I'm going to go first. And I kind of, I went back and forth between two horses for the first pick. I went back and forth between Tis the Law and Charlatan because I feel like those are the two most talented horses, you know, pound for pound in the country. I'm going to end up going with Tis the Law for a couple of reasons. First of all, I think he's more likely to run in all four of the quadruple crown races. Uh, he might show up at the Belmont, the Travers, the Derby, and the Preakness Barkley Tag. He's talked about doing that. I like how versatile he is. He can press the pace or he can come from off the pace. Charlatan, as brilliant as he is, has only done it on the lead so far, so you never know what's going to happen if he gets hooked and cooked. So, And also, Charlatan already has his breeding rights sold, so that's another factor. They might be a little bit... Uh, quicker to retire him than Tis the Law, and Tis the Law is a New York bred, so that was the tipping point for me. So Tis the Law, number one overall. John, very interesting. I, I was also uh, going back and forth between two horses, um, and before I announce those two horses, just so everyone at home understands the the trade, Brian and I traded. I traded the the fifth pick overall. Brian got the second pick overall. And Brian gets a horse to be named later. So Brian literally will be able to name a horse of ours at another future time. So Brian, start working on working on those names. Okay. Um, so I went back and forth between Tis the Law and who has now been picked as the number one pick overall and Maxfield. And I'm going to obviously select Maxfield um, basically because, you know, I was really impressed with his race last time out off a huge layoff. Um, he's already won a grade one. And, uh, you know, he's undefeated. Um, on top of that, he's won twice at Churchill Downs. So if the big points in our system is really predicated around the Kentucky Derby, um, here's a horse that's already run over the surface twice and won on the surface twice. And uh, quite frankly, it, it was a coin toss between Maxfield and Tis the Law. Um, so, Joe, you made it very easy for me. And I'm inheriting Maxfield and I couldn't be happier. My turn at number three. First of all, the contest is over. Uh, Joe was going to win because tis the law. John, that was a no brainer. Uh, um, you know, just like he said, he's the very good horse. He's going to run in everything where it looks like some of these other horses are going to have their races spread out. So we're talking now with the uh, defection of Nadal because of the injury, the so-called big four. And what's left among the big four are charlatan and authentic. 
And uh, I could toss a coin really and take either one, but I will take Charlatan because it looks like he is going to run in the Belmont and Authentic is not. And of course, the points are more for the Belmont than they are for the Santa Anita Derby. So I want to strike while the iron is hot. Hopefully, I'll get uh, Charlatan to win a big point race in the Belmont. So the Bill Finley Stables with the third pick in this year's 2020 fantasy draft will take Charlatan. <laughs> All right. So <clears throat> I handicapped this wrong in, in trying to trying to guess what you guys would go with. So um, that leaves me with the last of the big four or it leaves me with four B. Um, but I'm going to go with authentic uh, runs this weekend should be favored and, and tough to beat in the Sam needed Derby. And then let's see what, what happens from there. He's um, he's not ideal for me. I think he's still got some learning to do, but by the same token, if, if he continues to improve, who knows what his upside is. So I still have a few questions of exactly how far he wants to go and, and he needs to get things right in, in his head, needs to develop some mentally. But at uh, number four, I'll, I'll set with uh, Authentic. All right, so I've kind of got – so I've got two picks now. Um, for the first one, I'm kind of between the two honor codes, honor AP and max, and max player. Um, I guess I'll go to honor AP. I'm a little worried that he's not going to run in a bunch of races. But, I mean, it seems like he's got a good shot this weekend, and I think he's – a true classic distance horse. So that'll be my first pick. My second pick, I'm going to probably go a little early for taking my no points horse and take Todd Pletcher trainee, Dr. Post. Damn. Oh, no. Oh, <laughs> oh man. Oh, yep. scout he's, he's the absolute sleeper of this thing. He's like a really well-bred quality road, expensive horse, all that. Um, he's run a big figure at least once. One of stakes last time at Gulfstream with some trouble. And I watched his workout the other day on XBTV, and he dusted Governor Morris. So I think he's, you know, there's a lot of value there, especially since he seems like way the best horse with no points. Um, so that's why I traded down. Brian, I got I got to hand it to you because personally, we looked at him as a yearling and, and got way outbid. I mean, he, he sold for about four hundred thousand um, on the first day of the September sale, and loved him at the time, and was so happy to see that he was, you know, making his return and won the unbridled so easily. He was actually going to be my next pick. So kudos to you. I mean, not that I know anything, but that was a really nice pick. I'm probably in trouble. Everyone liked the horse. I might be in trouble. We'll see. I don't know exactly <laughs> where I don't, is he going? I don't even know where he's going, but he just seems like pretty. He's running into horse. Zoma. I think that's is the he? plan. Is, thanks. So. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, I'm happy that this guy's still available. I'm going to go with King Guillermo at number seven. Um, he's a horse that's proven um, that he classes up with this group. He doesn't need to take his racetrack with him. He's run well. Tampa ran well uh, at Oakland last time. I think he's a horse with tremendous upside. He should continue to improve as as the distances get longer. And I think he's um, I think he's a bit of a sleeper at number seven. So King Guillermo for me. All right. I will also be a little bit of a wise guy here and take my no point horse. And I like the strategy of Brian to take these horses early so that you have a horse that has some chance of picking up points rather than maybe taking them at the end of the draft. So I, I don't even know how to pronounce this. Rushi or Rushi going in the Santa Anita Derby yeah, this weekend. R-U-S-H-I-E. Yep. Uh, anybody got a pronunciation for me? Probably Sorry. wrong, but Rushi. We'll go okay. with Rushi. Rushi is me. Bill Finley takes in the second round of the fantasy draft. See, I need a derby starter, Rushy. Salmon, Salmon Rushy. Rushy, right? The guy that yeah. wrote there you go. Right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I know John's right. scrambling now because he wanted to come back, back to me. Back. I know two, two of my no pointers are, are off the board. I thought I was going to be really slick and, and come up with uh, with a couple of no pointers that you guys were, were hadn't even heard of. But um, all right. Well, I'm going to go with with the best talent on the board because, uh, like my New York Giants, sometimes you can't uh, just reach for you know, for a position, you got to go with, uh, with who you think is the, the best player on the board. Um, and I'm going to go with, uh, with one of the two being cone horses, uh, so Volante. That's who I'm going with my second pick in the, uh, in the draft. Want to get any explanation or anything you want to give the viewers? Um, just because I couldn't pronounce Rushy. Number one. Um, yeah, I think I think that as as the races get longer, he'll love the 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 rat of ground. Um, he's got really good dirt figures. They started him on the turf first time out. And even though he won both those, um, his numbers on the dirt 
just continue to improve. Um, I don't know between the two of them who they really feel is, is the better horse at say Indiana or, or Solo Valente. Um, but, uh, you know, just his running style of coming from off the pace with all these speed horses in, in these preps, um, I feel like that he's, you know, got a little bit of a better chance. Um, I'm trying to play an angle um, of picking a horse that, that picking two horses with Maxfield that come from off the pace because there's just so much speed um, out of this group of three year olds right now. Yeah, that was that was one of the horses I was bandying about for this pick as well. Um, I, I'm going with the top overall talent, BPA, as they say in the NFL draft, best player available. Uh, so I'm going to take Wells Bayou here. Um, you know, obviously the winner of the Louisiana Derby, but I thought even before that in the Southwest, he ran a really great race on a the lead on a fast pace and just got run down by Silver Prospector, who had a great trip. I know he's passing on the Belmont, but he's probably going to run in either the Bluegrass or the Indiana Derby. Hopefully one or two more races like like that before the Kentucky Derby. Uh, I worry a little bit, like John said, that there's so much speed in these prep races and these, these Kentucky Derby, um, the, these triple crown races, so he might get fried on the front end. But overall, I think of the horses remaining, he's got the most talent, so I'm going to take Wells Bayou at number 10. And at number 11, I'm going to go – I'm going to go a little bit out of the box here just because I want a closer. I want to, I want to like a deep closer. Like John said, like Soli Volante, this horse, he kind of needs everything to go his own way, but I think he's also the kind of horse who is going to run a lot and is going to clunk up and get a lot of checks, if not win these races. So I'm going to go with enforceable from the Mark Cassie barn and John Oxley. Uh, I just think he's the kind of horse who's always going to get a piece if he doesn't win and it'll be, a relatively easy way to, to, to stack up some points. So I'm going to go Wells Bayou number 10 and then enforceable number 11. Back to John. And, and Joe, just so you know, I actually spoke to, to Mark Cassie this morning um, about this horse in particular. And he said that um, like most tappets, you know, mentally, this horse just is just starting to put it together. Um, so he, he was on my list of potentials as well, but um, Mark is still feels like he's, you know, he's high on the horse and he feels like that the horse, the light's gone on. Finally. Um, so, uh, you know, again, I, I, uh, I think that's a good pick because those tappets are sometimes a little slow to develop mentally. Um, that being said, wow. So a lot of the horses that, I mean, you guys are, are right in line with, with what I had on, on uh, as far as the hierarchy of this group goes. Um, all right. Well, then I'm going to go with, with my no point horse right now. Um, and it's from the barn of, uh, of Brett Calhoun, Mr. Big News, Mr. Big News. Um, again, I think this horse is just starting to develop. He's a Giants causeway out of a Galileo mare, um, which Alan, you'll, I think you'll concur is distance, distance, distance. Um, and the longer, the better. He's improving every race. He's not there yet. He's not as good as the, as the big four or big five. Um, but I like his, his running style. And I think that he's a, a value pick here in the uh, third round. Are they, running, are they running these races on the turf this year, John? <laughs> At this point, I'm scrambling, Alan. I'm scrambling for whatever I can get. I'm hoping for rain. Praying for he rain. Was, uh, he was on my short list as well for no pointers. So. Yep. Bill, you're up, man. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm losing track of the order. Well, this is That's a no-brainer. And, John, thank you for passing on horse that was an obvious pick rather than your wise guy sleeper, Ete Indian. The other B and Cone, the 2020 Haskell winner, Ete Indian joins my stable. <laughs> That's the prediction, the Haskell winner, huh? Yeah. Nice. That's where he's headed. Very nice. All right. So I was looking for um, an Asmussen, really, because there seems to be every year an Asmussen that goes and wins Indiana, Ohio, West Virginia, and things like that. Um, I couldn't find it. Um, so I'm replacing Asmussen with Dale Roman. So I'm going to take attachment rate as a bit of a Outsider, like Joe said, the horse that could accumulate some points by maybe running in these lesser races. Um, you know, whether he's triple crown uh, caliber, I guess, is remains to be seen. But I think he's run some sneaky good races. Um, I thought his race against Maxfield last time was better than it probably looks on paper. So, bit of a, a bit of a outside the box pick, but attachment rate for me. Man, when you said Asmussen, I got worried for a second that my next pick wasn't going to be available, but I'll take Pneumatic. I thought he ran really well in the Matt win. Um, a lot of upside. I thought he was on the wrong part of the track. I'm kind of, I'm happy I can get him this far down, so I'll take him. And then to finish off my picks, um, another one I'm kind of shocked is still available, Max Player. 
running in the Belmont, has a lot of upside, um, kind of green still in his previous races, and he hasn't run for a while, obviously, with everything going on. But I think he's pretty legit, and I'm, that'll round out my four. Brian, Honestly, the only me. Yeah, Brian, let me just say, you know, Pneumatic actually isn't Triple Crown nominated. He is now. He is now? Yeah. He can still they, pay. I mean, okay. Because I know if, as, I, if this contest is close, I'll pay it. <laughs> <laughs> I know as of May 30th, he wasn't he yeah. wasn't nominated. Yeah, but he can still win the preps, though. So he can still win the preps. Yeah, he can still right. get the points. He got, he's in now, right? He's in oh. as of um, well, the late closing is today. And um, and he's in there, yeah. As is King Guillermo. All right, my um, I was between two horses for my no points. Um, I'm going to opt against Shooter Shoot, who ran very well and has some interesting form lines going back. Um, won his last at Oakland, and he's going to run this weekend. But um, I'm going to. Pin my hopes on TDN Rising Star Mystic Guide. Um, he was scratched from the rail. <laughs> Give me fist bump, Joe Fist. Um, <laughs> you know, he was drawing the rail in the mat win. They they chose to scratch. Um, he's now at Fair Hill with uh, Team Stidham. Had a good work the other day. I think he's um, entered tomorrow, Al. Is he? Yeah, he's in an allowance. Yeah. Him, he and another okay. sleeper are both in an allowance tomorrow at Belmont. So. Okay. Um, I'm going to stick with him and hope that he'll use that as a springboard to you know, something like the Haskell or uh, something like that going forward. Mystic guy for me. Sorry, Joe. All right. Well, I'm looking at a horse that I hope goes the Ohio Derby type route because I don't think he's good enough to really compete in the triple crown races or to pick up many points. So I'll go with our friend Safi Joseph and NY Traffic. And again, hoping that that's a horse that can get kind of cheap points in, in lesser preps. And, uh, you know, good enough horse that I'm a little bit surprised that he's still available as well. So NY traffic for me. That, that's a good pick. That's a good pick. Uh, value pick, as it were, Bill. Because um, he's been improving every race, uh, you know, as a three-year-old. And, and you, you got to root for Cassius King and LC Racing. They're, they're, they're good friends of, of mine and good friends of the, to, to the show and, and uh, good people. So we'll... Plus, it's a cross traffic. We, you know, we personally well, have tell them. Tell them I said, look at the uh, Iowa and Ohio derbies of the world. I, for me, I will. Okay? I will definitely make sure that they listen. <laughs> exactly, they listen to that. Um, this is really interesting because I actually had three pe- three horses that were uh, that were all kind of on a flat foot tie. You just took one of them, um, and now I got to choose between Basin and Modernist, and I'm going to go with Modernist. Strictly because he had a terrible post in the Louisiana Derby. He was number 14 of 14 um, and just had, was four or five wide the entire race um, and never really got into gear. But I think he's improving. Um, he's certainly not as good as any of the other horses that we had, you know, in the first couple of rounds for sure. Um, but I have to have faith in Bill Mott and an Uncle Mo out of a Bernardini mare. Um, just screams long and, and dirt and uh, Hopefully he'll, uh, you know, step up in one of these preps and then uh, get in through the back door into the uh, the derby. So I will go with Modernist. I think he would love a 12 for on Belmont this year. That works. He, he definitely would. It's it's unfortunate that uh, that's not the case this year, but uh, but we'll see. At this point, it, it's the last round. It, it's it's almost Mister Irrelevant. So uh, so I want to draft, you know, for value. Um, we'll we'll go with uh, the Y Gods in uh, in Belmont on that one. Modernist with my last pick. All right, so this was a horse that I, you guys all took my zero points horses, so I'm, I'm scrambling a little bit. But this is a horse that I mentioned last week on the podcast. He ran on. Uh, hold on one second. Never mind. She's a Philly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the Gary Meyer West horse. <laughs> no, it was like the Cliff Size horse that I talked about last week. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. The beat the, you caught yourself. The beat the yeah, that would have been fun. So. I'm actually surprised that, I mean, these, these aren't going to help you, Joe, so you don't have to listen, but I'm surprised that that Farmington Road and Basin and and Storm the Court last year's, uh, you know, Juvenile Breeders' Cup winner are still on, on the board. I guess we only have, it was, Brian, the uh, the idea of having a no point pick was huge because there's there's some really good horses that are still kind of on the on the AE. Yeah. As, 
So, so for my last pick, uh, I almost picked the Philly, but instead <laughs> I'm going to pick, I'm going to go, I'm going to go uh, a little out of the box here. The unbridled stakes was a, a, a stake that they added at Gulfstream in, in uh, April. And the top two horses from there were picked uh, Dr. Post and attachment rate by Brian and Al respectively. I'm going to go with the pace setter in there. He was third horse named Americanus for Mark Hennig and Cortland Farms. Had a good looking allowance win at, at Goldstream before that and set a fast pace in the unbridled and just, you know, gave it up a little bit late, finished third, but was only beaten two and three quarter lengths by Dr. Post. Uh, I think this is a horse who will get better with distance going forward by Warfront. Um, so not not ideal. Brian stole my, I think Brian stole everybody's new zero points horse and, and a couple other ones got snagged before me. So I'm going to take Americanus from the Mark Hennig Barn. Last pick of the 2020 TDN writer's room fantasy three-year-old draft. And we will now put a big graphic up that shows you everybody's stable, <laughs> all 20 horses. Um, should be a lot of fun. It should add, add a lot of intrigue to this. Uh, you know, I, I said this back in like December or January when I was like, man, it's going to get really tiresome talking about these three-year-olds every single week. And now here we are in June and we still haven't had any triple crown races yet. So this will add a lot of spice to it, add a little diversity to it. Give us a rooting interest. Um, so best of luck to all you guys. Thanks for participating. And thanks to Brian for the idea. And uh, we look forward to it. We're going to we're gonna check in on this every week that there's a three-year-old prep. Obviously, this week we start with the San Diego Derby. So there'll be something to talk about next Wednesday in terms of our staples. So uh, best of luck to all. Let's get it on. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. For more information on how they can help you, visit www.greenco.com. This week's Green Group Guest of the Week is Hall of Famer, man who needs no introduction, and complete stranger to our producer, Patty Wolf, Shug McGahey. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Sure. Um, so we'll start with this. The big news, obviously, this week, Code of Honor making his return in the, in the Westchester. Had a tremendous three-year-old season. Finished second somewhat controversially in the three-year-old championship race. We'll get your thoughts on that, too. Uh, I wanted to know how you've seen him develop over the winter and how that might inform the way you campaign him this year. Well, uh, you know, he, he's had a little bit longer vacation than I'd expected. I thought that uh, the Westchester would be the opening day of Belmont, and obviously there wasn't any opening day of Belmont till now. But I don't think it's hurt anything. He had a really good winter. We gave him off to the 1st of February and put him back in training. And he's an athletic type of horse, so it doesn't take a whole lot to uh, kind of get him ready. And, um, you know, I think he's ready. He's got a – he had a good winter at Pace and Park. His two works here at Belmont have been just as good as I could expect. And, you know, we're looking forward to running him on Saturday. Chug, hi, it's Bill Finley, and thanks for joining us. And just to piggyback on what Joe said, I wanted to see if you had laid out any sort of schedule for him. I would imagine you're looking at the Breeders' Cup Classic, but how do you go from the Westchester to the Breeders' Cup Classic? Do you look at the Jockey Club Gold Cup again? Just generally, what are your some of your goals for 2020 with this horse? Well, you will run. I mean, the Metropolitan could be on the map. The Whitney could really be on the map. Um Woodward or Jockey Club Gold Cup. I mean, you know, who knows how they're going to have those things scheduled. But, you know, we'd definitely like to get to the, you know, we were good when we were still going along. We'd definitely like to get to the Breeders' Cup Classic, especially with it being at Keeneland. Um, you know, it would have a special meaning for Mr. Parrish and, you know, basically for myself too. Um, but, you know, we'll sort of let him tell us like we did last year and bring him along as uh, he sees pleased. and. And, um, you know, hopefully we can run in the, after the Westchester. We can be participants in the big, big races. We go all the rest of the year. Chug, it's uh, Jonathan Green. Thank you again for, for being on the show. Um, you know, we've been following your career for years and just been very impressed. Obviously, you're a Hall of Famer and you've, you've managed and campaigned a number of Hall of Fame horses. When we didn't have as much racing going on um, in April, one of the pieces that we did here was to name our favorite horse. And ironically enough, two out of the four of us picked horses of yours. Um, Bill actually has had Easy Goer as his favorite all-time horse, and I have Personal Ensign as my 
um, favorite horse of all time. Can you give us some background or maybe a funny anecdote about either of those two horses when you were campaigning those Hall of Famers? Well, I think with Bill and Easy Gore, it was, it was a heartbreaking year for him. But <laughs> for Bill, he was he was a, he was a terrific fan of of Easy Gore's, and uh, you know, and and appropriately so. And you know, I was I was glad he was. And we go back a long way. Um, you know, I, I think that that everything went great. You know, we got to Louisville for the Derby, and you know, we kind of caught the same sort of track that we did at. Um, in the Breeders' Cup two-year-old, and I don't think he particularly cherished that. And we finished second to a very good horse. And then we got to the Preakness, and, you know, I was kind of, you know, is he as good as Sunday Silence or not? And, I mean, even though I was just a beat a nose, um, you know, I knew then we were in the ball game. And then when we got back here, he just thrived when he got back to Belmont and then ran a huge race. and. Going through the rest of them, the Whitney was good, the Travers was good, the Woodward was good, the Gold Cup was good, and when they drew for the Breeders' Cup Classic, when they had the little press conference after the draw, Mr. Whittingham said, I think I got the best of the sugar on the draw. He drew the outside, I drew the inside, and we watched the replay of the race. We kind of ducked to the inside, leaving there, and he got to jump on us, and you know, then I remember McCarran telling me, he said, we were going down the backside. I heard somebody coming, and um, I didn't have to look over my shoulder. I knew who it was. So then he went and opened up on us. We just we weren't able to catch him, and so that was sort of that. And with uh, you know personal incident, it was you know I mean she ran a great race as a two year old when she won the her maiden race, and then she came back and won was the Frisette, you know, we're on our way to the Breeders' Cup, and the Breeders are here to go out there, and she breeds terrific, and but came back bad uh, and cracked the pastern and, you know, put five screws in it. Uh, Dr. Bramlage did, and, you know, I thought that was, then I went on to California, had, you know, to the Breeders' Cup with uh, Polish baby, and, you know, I thought, you know, we were just trying to save her life and make a broodmare out of her. And, you know, it, uh, surgery wasn't quite as sophisticated then as it is now, even though they had come a long way. And, um, you know, I got back here and they operated on over at Dr. Reed's hospital and he came, stopped and said, you know, that filly's going to be fine. And I said, what do you mean it's going to be fine? And she was back in the barn then. And so I quickly got on the phone to, Dr. Bamlage, and he said, well, she might hurt something else, but she ain't going to hurt that one. So that ain't going to be the problem. And then she went on and had just an unbelievable, um, you know, three-year-old year. And um, we delected not to go to the Breeders' Cup because that was the year they ran at Hollywood Park, like the 20th or 21st of, um, of November, and brought her back. So we just gave her some time off and then brought her back in the in the spring and you know she won the shoe v and the, what's now logged and fits was the hempstead then and there was some chatter well she just wins at belmont so i took her down to monmouth and she won the molly pitcher pretty easy there and then mr phipps was kind of anxious to uh see what she did against the colt so i said well let's give her a whirl on the whitney and she was able to beat gulch and king swan in there and then came back and <clears throat> you know she won the bell dame she won the mascot, beating winning colors in there, and then she won the Bell Dame easy, and then we got to Louisville, and you know I thought everything was on go, and kind of called for any racetrack, whether she liked it or not, I don't know, but um, you know it looked like all the way around there that nothing was going to happen, and then finally she kicked in and was able to beat winning colors and nose, and goodbye Halo, who'd won the Oaks was third, and Randy came back and. Said, looked at me and said, never in doubt. I said, well, I'm glad I felt that way because I sure didn't. But it was it was uh, a lot of fun having her or having both horses. And, you know, they were both kind of career makers for anybody, and they sure were for me. Uh, hi, Shrek. It's Alan Carrasso. And I'm going to ask you a, a question about a lesser known of your four-year-olds who, um, whose female family actually includes personal ensign and, and her daughter, My Flag. But could you talk a little bit about a performer who's 
Uh, I know he's on the comeback trail. He's had a couple of breezes um, for you coming back. Um, not many of yours go favored first asking, but he was ran a credible race and, and really nobody's gotten near him since, but can you give us an update on performer? Well, he's entered in a Carter on Saturday. I think he's had a really good winter. You know, he's another one that was on goal and was coming up here to run the Carter on Wood Memorial Day, which I think was the 4th of April. So he's been on hold for two months, too. And then when we didn't get to run, you know, I kind of backed off of him a little bit. And then I was just sort of trying to think in my head that to get him ready again when, when the Carter might be. And, um, you know, they kept telling us that maybe we were going to run on the 22nd, maybe the 29th, and then end up being on, Ju- you know, we start today. And his race is on June the 6th. So he had a very, very good winter in, in Payson Park, and he's come back up here. And his couple of works here have been really on go. And, and you know, then again, I'm I'm glad to get him back to the races. And, you know, we're in the car to win, but we'd like to just get a good solid race into him to move him on for the rest of the year. But uh, he's gotten bigger and stronger. And I think his races in the three-year-old, his three-year-old year were, you know, kind of established him to where he is today and, you know, made, made him sort of grow up and learn about what it, what it's all about. And, you know, I think that uh, he'll make a credible performance Saturday. Joe, it's Joe again. Al kind of stole my thunder. I wanted to ask about performer, but I'll go to, my, go to my next question that, you know, Belmont opening up, I think, is a big, big seminal moment for racing in this coronavirus era. Uh, I grew up going to Belmont and it's it's a huge deal to see it back running again. I think of you as a Belmont guy. Obviously, you stable at Payson in the winter in the winter, but think of you as a guy who's based out of Belmont. Can you just talk a little bit about the significance of getting Belmont? to running again after what we've gone through the last couple of months in New York. Well, you are right about that. I'm a Belmont guy. I'd rather train here than, than, than anywhere. And I love the races here. You know, I mean, we're going to get started and, you know, the racing throughout the summer and next fall is, is going to be great. And I think for New York and for, you know, us as racing people and, you know, in the sports world, getting Belmont going is going to be a big addition. You know, this is kind of the first big sporting event that's opened up up here. And, um, you know, I'm excited about it. Been excited about whenever they're going to get it open. Was kind of getting a little flustered that we weren't getting open. But we're here here now. We're going to get started. And, um, you know, all systems will go. It's going to be, you know, a little bit funny because, you know, we're getting kind of, you know, almost a two months late start, a month and a half. And so it's going to be a short season. But, you know, I think they've done a incredible job of writing the condition book and trying to give everybody a chance to uh, to run. I think some of the races that they overfill will probably, you know, they'll come back with to where you'll get a chance, chance to run. But I think it is an exciting time. And I think today will be an exciting day getting started. Um, with the TV coverage that we're going to have. And, you know, even though there's no people here, I think there's going to be a lot of eyes on, on Belmont Park this afternoon and rightfully so. Chuck, Bill Finley, um, I want to unfortunately bring up a messy subject, but I think it's necessary to talk to you about it because of your status in the industry. And also by the, the way that you have throughout your career have obviously played by the rules. And we spoke earlier about uh, the three-year-old championship last year. It was won by a horse, Maximum Security, who now is front and center in one of the the biggest scandals in horse racing history. Uh, You don't need me to fill in the blanks. But I would just like Sean Gahey's take on the indictments of those trainers and uh, again, what it's like, I don't know if if Service or Navarro ever beat you in any races. They probably did uh, as many horses as they ran. But what it is like for somebody like yourself, who, again, uh, tries to do everything right and sometimes would get beat by people who look for an illegal edge. Well, of course, Bill, it's a disappointment. And like I said, we have talked about it before. And, you know, I would like that uh, if it ever could be for the game to be on a level playing field where everybody had uh, the same chance. I mean, you know, years back when I first started, we were around here with Woody and Wayne and um, you know, some of the other great, great trainers that lived around there it was fun. I didn't mind competing against them, but 
some of these guys today, you know, you almost say they're in the race. I don't, I don't really want to run against them. Navarro never was a big problem with me, but service was because I never did really run against Navarro that much. But, you know, service was, and, uh, you know, I had a hard time with a 60, horse and brakes was made for 16,000, went in the Kentucky Derby and Florida Derby and all, all that he did. You know, whether anything was going on or not with him, I, I you know, how do I know? But I know, well, I read every sentence of all those indictments when they got indicted on all the people. And, you know, it's it's pretty disappointing. And it's disappointing when, you know, I look and read where, you know, veterinarians are doing what they're doing when, you know, most of the time, you know, they've got an ed- education. And when they graduate, from, you know, they're sworn to uphold their <laughs> doctor's commitment and you know they're doing things to cheat um you know i think that they know better and they should you know they shouldn't be doing so i'm hoping that you know in the long run that you know whether it's a horse race and integrity bill and WADA or whoever it's going to be um that, that you know we can get a hold on this thing and and you know that everybody feels like when they go over there that they've got you know an equal chance to uh everybody else or at least close to an equal chance and that's really about all i think we can ask for and shuck john green again one of the other topics that, that that's relatively you know in the news and controversial has to do with the jockey club imposing a 140 mare limit onto these stallions now most of the horses that you train are homebreds um and most of them come from claiborne which pretty much already adheres to kind of a soft cap of 125 to 140 mares to their more popular stallions how how do you think this is going to affect racing going forward with the jockey clubs um you know new cap of 140 mares going to stallions well jonathan i'm not opposed to it i mean i came around in the time when they bred them to 40 mares you know i mean and uh claiborne like you say my teeth are more into claiborne than anyway because i've been around them so long with the you know, with most of the horses that I get have been bred, you know, been bred and raised on that farm, and a lot of them by the by Claiborne stallions, and um, so I don't think it'll it'll hurt anything, and I think it'll probably help the longevity of the stallion a little bit. I mean, when you see that, you know, they're going over there and getting bred to 200 or 220 mares, and you know, I mean, how many times are they going to get bred? Because it's all we all know they don't all get sold first time you, you breed them so you know there's comebacks too so how many times they get bred um you know it's going to be a lot more than what what says you know that we bred 220 mares well they might have bred you know some of those mares two three four times to, you know hopefully get them in bowl and then you know a lot of them are, are uh you know shipping in the southern hemisphere too so i think that probably in the longevity of the stallion will probably uh probably help and you know i know some people are going to have some some qualms with it they think that well you're going to have more of a you're going to have a lot better chance if you um um breed your stay into to more mares to get a decent horse but maybe in the long run that doesn't have to be true you know that uh, sometimes less is more so it's uh alan again i'm a uh, i'm chicago born and raised uh grew up about 10 minutes from Arlington park I wanted to take you back to 1993 and the rivalry between Lure and Star of Cozine that was played out in the Manhattan and then um, in the the Caesars. Um, Star of Cozine got the better of you both times. And then you had a date planned uh, for the Arlington Million at the end of August, but uh, Lure was forced to miss that because uh, the ground went completely against you. What what kind of performance, looking back, if you can do that, um, you know, what, what kind of performance would the fans have been treated to that day had you been able to run? Well, I think, they, you know, I mean, he was a very good horse. He was very fast, but he wanted it firm. I mean, uh, uh, Star, Starkle, Starkle's Eve was very good. Um, when he beat us, it beat us here, it had a little bit of cut in the ground and maybe we, you know, weren't as good as, as he was over that type of, Ground. Then when we went down to Atlantic City, it was. I remember sitting in the box with Mr. Levy, and he said everything ought to be good. So we won. You know, then we had a little thunderstorm too. But um, so he wasn't quite as good as Star Cozine on that type of a of a track. But 
that was kind of a weird situation at in Arlington. I remember, you know, they tell me when I was flying over there that it was gonna rain and when I landed at O'Hare and a plane, you know, looked like it was landing in a lake. So I knew knew then that you know, this this wasn't going to happen. So when I got there, they had uh, they had some kind of a EVA or something going on there, and uh, we were in a tent. That thing had water in it. Um, you know, I got there, and Dell Hancock happened to be sitting there on a on a bucket. And she said, "What are we going to do?" And I said, "We're going to scratch." <laughs> it's not that easy to scratch in a million dollar race when you're eight to five in the program, but um, it was the best thing for the horse. But you know, it was a, it was a race that I would you know I would if everything had been right I would sure love to have been able to run it. All right, Shug, thank you so much for the time. Uh, best of luck this meet, and uh, best of luck with Code of Honor. We're looking forward to seeing him. Okay, well I'm looking forward to running. Thank you guys. Thank you, Shug. Thank, All right, you, thanks, Shug. thank you very much. You bet. Bye. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As The Green Group Guest of the Week, Shug McGahee will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. To learn more about how they can help you, visit www.greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. The Green Group is widely recognized as the top-rated tax and accounting firm specializing in the horse business. Why do the top owners, breeders, pin hookers, and trainers trust The Green Group as their tax advisors? The difference is experience. Firm founder Len Green has over four decades of experience owning, breeding, and racing horses. First-hand knowledge gives Green Group clients proven tax and money-saving strategies. Visit The Green Group at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. So that's going to do it for this week's edition of the TDN Riders Room presented by Keeneland. Remember, Keeneland will conduct an online select horses of racing age sales starring John Green on June 23rd in the Keeneland Digital Sales Ring. Entries are accepted through June 12th. Learn more at KeenelandSelect.com. I want to thank Bill Finley, John Green, Alan Carrasso, Brian DiDonato, our Green Group Guest of the Week, Shug McGahee, our producer, Patty Wolf, our editor is Danny Seiper and Anthony LaRocca, and our production coordinator, Michelle Sabrino. Thanks so much for tuning in. Stay safe out there, especially now. We'll see you next week.